Good morning and a very warm welcome to St. Lawrence's this morning. Do please stand. We meet in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The Lord be with you. Um, very appropriate opening, opening song this morning. Today we're thinking about our desire for God and how we give form to that as a church community. So as we still ourselves in God's presence, let us draw to mind our sins. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven, and to bring us to eternal life. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolved to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all. Together we say, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We say together the words of God's praise in the Gloria. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High. Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, you search us and know us. May we rely on you in strength and rest on you in weakness, now and in all our days, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Jane is going to read our first reading. Do please be seated. reading from the book of Solomon. The voice of my beloved, look he comes, leaping upon the mountains, bounding over the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Look, there he stands, behind our wall, gazing in at our windows, looking through the lattice. My beloved speaks and says to me, arise my love, my fair one, and come away. For now the winter is past, the rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth, the time of singing has come, and the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig tree puts forth its figs, and the vines are in blossom. They give forth fragrance. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
I invite you to stand for the Gospel reading. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. Now when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus, they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands, that is, without washing them. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they thoroughly wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. And they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash it. And there are also many other traditions that they observe like the washing of cups, pots, and bronze kettles. So the Pharisees and the scribes asked Jesus, why, or, why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? Jesus said to them, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honours me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. You abandon the commandment of God and hold to human tradition. Then Jesus called the crowd again and said to them, Listen to me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile. But the things that come out are what defile. For it is within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come. Fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, Wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, and folly. All these things come from within, and they defile a person. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Do please be seated. Commentators over the, over the years have struggled to know what to do with um, that beautiful first reading we had, that love poem um, about uh, a, a woman for her lover. Um, and uh, they both praise the fact that's in scripture, but also don't know what to do with it in terms of how that relates to who God is. Well, the traditional answer that's formulated, and I think it's probably the right answer, is that the desire that's expressed in human love is a picture of um, our desire for Christ and Christ's desire for us. So we learn through our human love for each other um, to, to love God and to know what that love looks like. Now, as I explained um, at the beginning of the service, we're thinking today about St. Lawrence's desire for God and how we fulfill that, how we give that form. We're doing something a little bit unusual today, so if you're not used to being at St. Lawrence's uh, do bear in mind, we don't spend our time week by week looking at three sheets of data together. Uh, we do normally have sermons in church, so it's a little bit different to how things are usually. Um, but what I would say to you is that this shows you how we're thinking and how we are as a, as a congregation. We're interested in what everyone in St. Lawrence's thinks about our life as a church, and we take that information to our PCC as the body which is responsible for leading the life of this church in order to process it, think about it, and make sense of it. Now, our readings this morning deal with different generations. We've got these young lovers, and we've also got Jesus' disciples, who are probably in their 30s, like Jesus is, uh, and we've got these Pharisees, who sound like they're quite a bit older. They've been around for a bit, uh, pale and stale, quite possibly. But alongside that chronological picture of age, we've got a different picture of aging going on as well. 
There's an aging of faith which we can see behind our stories too. So the young lovers, for them, their faith is something that's quite distant, quite possibly. Jesus' disciples are new to the faith in their encounter with Jesus. And he and they are trying to work out together what this new Christian faith looks like, partly in dialogue with those who've been part of it for a long time. And the Pharisees are off the far end of, of the scale of age of their faith. Um, they've been left with human doctrines and human precepts. They've forgotten that it's all about God, in fact. That's a distant truth for them. So two different images of aging then, one which is about human chronology and the other which is about how faith ages and is either young and fresh and needing to be given form um, or it can become very old and need to be renewed because it's kind of gone off the boil, it's lost the plot a bit. And that's a helpful way into looking at the data we're going to look at um, this morning to think about those different models of aging and aging faith. I've drawn on the work of a um, theologian called Impey, uh, who does congregational studies, um, and his work dates back to 2010. At this point, what I'd like to do is to turn to your A4 sheets so I can take you through the information that's there. If you don't have one, do you want to stick a hand up so that um, someone can bring you one? Fantastic. So I think we've all got one of those um, now. Now at the top you see those seven uh, figures depicting the seven ages of humanity, a reference to Shakespeare in that comment. Um, and what Impey does is he draws a parallel between a human life cycle and human aging and what happens with a congregation in a church, how that starts young, grows older and matures. So let's look first at the um, left-hand side of that table, 5.1, to think about, are you okay there, Heather? Do you have a copy? Do you have a copy? Do you have a copy, Heather? Do you have a copy of this? So on the left-hand side of the table, rather than seven ages, we've got nine ages. We start with babies, we move on to young children, school children, adolescents, and then young adults, prime of life, maturity, seniority, and old age. So that's the, the picture that Impey is drawing on, which he then applies to a church congregation and what happens there. So there he starts with a brand new church, the founder's baby, so for St. Lawrence, that was back um, in the 1920s, 1930s. Finding our feet when the church is still dependent on its founders for encouragement and shape, then learning its tradition, being dependent on teachers for its knowledge and know-how, um, but then starting to mature, wanting to take responsibility, the congregation wanting to take responsibility of itself as part of the church community and desire then to move on from what's been inherited. As it approaches maturity, it then explores possibilities and chooses priorities within its life. Before then, at step six, everything's up and running, and there's a sense that we've arrived, a sense of satisfaction. Decline is fast on the heels of that, um, so despite seven being described as established a mold for others, you'll note that it's even at that point that complacency starts to creep in. Rather than the decision-making being shared, it starts to be pulled in a smaller group of people um, who become the aristocracy. Step eight is going stale. Um, and again, a uh, small group of people making decisions at that point. But what distinguishes that later stage is the idea that there's lots of work that needs to be done and there's no one to do it. So the aristocracy are, are complaining about the fact that no one's stepping up to help them. Uh, before then, finally, um, stagnation. 
when nothing much happens and uh, the church is closing down or hanging on uh, by its fingernails. So if you turn over the page, you'll remember we did survey work back in April and the PC has now had time to look at that survey work and digest it. Uh, and as we come into the autumn, we've got a couple of congregational meetings set up to help us to uh, process and do some work off the back of this. So I'm wanting to use this Sunday and next Sunday to take you through what we've learnt from the census data. So the top um, chart, the top table, um, plots out how people voted in terms of where they thought St Lawrence's was on that nine-point age scale with uh, one being brand new and nine being stagnation. Now you'll see there are two clusters where the numbers go up a bit. Um, the first is number five, and the second where there's a larger pool is um, seven and eight, so the established and the going stale. Um, and for those, we've got uh, 22 people who voted for number eight, and 18 people who voted for number seven. And the largest uh, peak after that is the number five um, data, which we had 11 votes for. So again, just to remind you, um, the number seven is when complacency starts to creep in and decisions are made by the aristocracy. And number eight is when there starts to be a lament uh, that others are not stepping up to do the works that need to be done. Now, as we start to process that information and make sense of it, of what you've said, I want us to think about um, the, this life cycle of a, a congregation in terms of uh, dependency in the first instance. Um, and that dependency, it's helpful to think about dependency in terms of the number of people who are contributing to the church's life and the number of people who are dependent upon others within the church's life. Now again, the easiest way into this is to think about age profile. So the net contributors um, on this central table are those who are maturity, in maturity, those who are in the prime of life, young adults and uh, perhaps teens. Whereas those who tend to be dependent are babies, young children, school children, seniors, and those in their old age. What I've done uh, underneath that central table is to plot out the age profile of the congregation, and you'll see I've split that into three. So the top section um, from 70 upwards is for increasing dependency. You'll see there are 36 people who fall into that category. Those who'd normally be in the net contributors bracket, I've put between being 20 and 69. And those who are young and dependent, um, there are 37 of those. So if you look at the balance of the congregation in terms of age profile and economic productivity, rather than um, their spiritual lives, you see that those who would you normally expect to dependent significantly outweigh uh, those who would normally be net contributors. Namely, there are 73 at the top and the bottom in total, and 46 um, in the middle. Now let's move on from thinking about um, net contributors to thinking about a mixture of impetus and inertia within a congregation. Age is far from capturing um, everything. There are many people in their older years who have a young and lively faith, and there are people I've met in their 20s uh, who stick to routine and don't like anything very much new. So we're looking at something a bit deeper than that. We're looking at something more thoughtful than that in terms of understanding what's going on in the congregation. And one of the ways into doing that thinking is to think about the idea of impetus and inertia. And impetus and inertia are in balance with each other throughout a congregation's life cycle. One tends to predominate over the other. So what's impetus? Well, it's characterized by excitement, innovation, a sense of discovery and newness, a tantalizing mix of confidence with uncertainty. Uncertainty in that um, bracket is of not knowing what will happen next but expecting it to be good. So there's an optimism um, that goes alongside that uncertainty. And if there's a weakness of impetus, it's, uh, like, it's this. 
Its weakness can be the avoidance of moving on, rather like couples who fear that when the first excitement of falling in love fades, their whole relationship is over. The beginning is just that, wonderful in its way, but not the whole story. So that's the impetus side of things. The inertia side of things is a kind of comfortable, um, satisfying place. It's characterized by contentment, feeling settled, enjoying a familiar routine. Also a mix of confidence and uncertainty, but the uncertainty this time is of fearing that this all might be under threat and may not last very long. So there's a corresponding weakness that goes with inertia. The avoidance of moving on, as if we could stay in contented middle age forever. It wants to hang on to that which only thrives, if it is handed on. Now if we go back to that life cycle at the top, you can see there are good times for um, inertia to dominate, and there are good times for impetus to dominate. So if you're starting off a new church community, you need people with a sense of adventure and positivity about what's going to happen in the future and are ready to set off into the unknown. But it's not long after you've kind of launched yourself in that way that you start to need a bit of stability. And then impetus kicking in is really helpful. It sets up routines and structures and ways of doing things and um, just a sense that people can know what's going to happen when they come to church next week rather than being thrown off course by the unexpected. But as soon as you get past that uh, middle point of the life cycle, impetus can start to put things, uh, impetus can start to be overbalanced by inertia. So the church will contract um, spiritually and in terms of numbers um, and go to a, a bad place ultimately through a lack of readiness to change and embrace the new. So two different models there, one thinking about um, net contributors and net dependents within a church community, and the other thinking about the balance of impetus and inertia within a church's life, and the need for both at different stages, but for them to be appropriately balanced depending on where you are in the life cycle. Can I ask you please to move on to the next um, page, which has got the graph at the top and the numbers five and eight marked on it. Now you can see at five, you've got uh, your impetus being stronger than your inertia. You're heading upwards. Uh, and at number eight, you've got your inertia stronger than your impetus. So you're heading towards, rather than church growth, the church contracting. What I asked those responding to the survey to do was to tell me why they'd chosen the point they had that they thought that St. Lawrence's was on, on the life cycle. So we'll start with those who chose number five, the idea of exploring possibilities and choosing priorities. This is what they said was the reason for choosing that number. I would have liked to have ticked several boxes. I just feel that whilst I have not been involved, there is a sense of discovery and purpose and going forward. But the going stale box probably sums up the immediate situation. I hope and pray that my choice is a better one. Another person said, finding ways to work together again after a change in vicar. Another person said, have answered because we are in process, otherwise may have answered stagnation. And then the last one, I feel that our current interim vicar and a good vicar to follow him, with our current interim vicar and a good vicar to follow him, we can progress in settling to know God better and caring for each other and the wider community. So that's what the people who chose exploring possibilities and choosing priorities said was their reason for doing that. If we turn to number eight and to going stale, this is what uh, those people said by way of why they'd chosen that option. We need to embrace new ideas. We got too comfortable. We should not be afraid to try new things. A mix of tradition and modern can work well together. I feel that sometimes those who've been established longer and frightened of no longer being valued, which is natural, but this then risks stifling the newer members. 
and not allowing growth. Another person said, decisions made by the few appears insufficient people coming forward to manage the work, but it could be that we are not welcoming enough and people feel they're not wanted. And then another person, up and coming generation have less time available than previously. So if you can move on to page five for me. One things we need to do within the interim process is bring those two groups of people who seem to see things in the church slightly differently together in order to have a conversation about what we do next. Um, and that's what I've tried to illustrate um, in these diagrams. You've got the impetus dominant group and you've got the inertia, inertia, in, uh, inertia dominant group um, and they need to be brought together as part of the interim process. And why is that? Well, if you look at the, the bottom um, diagram on that page and imagine yourself into these different kinds of uncertainty encountering each other. So the uncertainty of not knowing what will happen next, but expecting it to be good, meeting the uncertainty of fearing that this all might be under threat and may not last long. If those two people encounter each other, they're going to make each other uh, more anxious still. Indeed, there may be a sense of conflict between them. So what's important is to have a structured sense of encounter between those two different perspectives so they can understand each other, so that we can have critical engagement between them, and that group as a whole then discern what the next step is for a church community. And the census data, the rest of the census data, helps us to plot what that direction might look like. Let's move on to church growth on the last page. Now, it's possible for a church congregation to um, hop off of that life cycle curve uh, potentially at any point. So there are two different possibilities to that which are considered um, here. The first is, and in some ways, you know, if you're running a business, this would be the ideal point to hop off and grow even more is when you get to your peak. Um, so you continue to grow and grow and grow. Now, in reality, that's not possible for most churches. It might be possible in a, a particularly large church or a youth or university church because of the large resource pool um, that they have. Now, there's a downside even with that approach in that the congregation might never uh, mature. We might end up with parallel congregations in that point. So most congregations tend to have a period of decline before they then have an upward tick of growth. And that largely reflects that most uh, parishes have limited resources, and those resources therefore need to be redirected to a new project effectively. So it's usually not possible to meet all of the needs of diversity within a local area, or indeed all of the diverse needs within a congregation. Choices need to be made rather than being able to be all things to all people, hence the need for different views within the congregation to encounter each other and understand each other. There can be loss that goes alongside uh, that decision-making process where you've got limited resources, and it requires wisdom and maturity to engage with that. That really takes us back to the point we started at and the idea of our love for God and God's loves for us. When God calls us to wisdom and maturity in the context of change, we're working out how to express our desire for God in new ways, as well as learning more about what God wants for us in life and his call for us to be mature in life. So that's an overview of the census data on where you think the church is in terms of its life cycle and what that data means. Next Sunday, I'm going to talk to you about some of the other census data, which gives us a sense of the direction you think St. Lawrence's should move in next, and the kind of outlook the congregation has as a whole, the way you think about your faith, and the way you think about the world um, that we live in. That's the next step to us then focusing in on what our future together might look like. So do please put in your diary, um, next Sunday at 2 p.m. 
to think about who we are today. And then on the 3rd of October, uh, the month afterwards, thinking about those around us. How do we relate to and engage with the community um, that's around us? How do we think about their needs and think about how we engage with those? This is all about responding to God's love and our desire for God being expressed in a way which responds to him. So I invite you to stand as we declare our common faith in the words of the Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets, we believe in one holy, catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Arthur is going to lead us in our intercessions. Please sit or kneel to pray. Almighty Father, you promised that when two or three are gathered together in your name, you will grant their requests. Lord, may we walk in your ways and obey your laws. Help us to live our lives in love for you and of each other, that we may be of service to all. May your love pour upon us so that we may pass it on to all we meet to all we meet and draw more people to your church lord in your mercy hear our prayer hear our prayer lord for your church guide its leaders that they may strengthen it and enthuse its people with the mission of the gospels we pray especially for Sarah and Pete, our bishops, for all clergy and all those who do your work in this world. <clears throat> Guide them, strengthen them, and help them in their work. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear our prayer, Lord for your world and its governments. We remember those areas of the world where there is conflict and unrest. We particularly pray for Afghanistan. <clears throat> May the current turmoil cease and the country return to a properly governed and civilized place. 
be with those who are trying to leave and those who will be left behind in the exodus. Guide them all to do that which is best for them. In the coming days, guide those who seek to end the problems that peace and reconciliation may prevail. We also pray for those who do not have enough food. Help them in their poverty and may all the peoples of this world assist them by providing food and nourishment in their need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear our prayer, Lord, for our parish. We give thanks for all that is done for us in this parish, for the work of Father John, of Julia, Alan, Barbara and Rosemary, as well as by all others who work in this place. Give us the vision to see the future, knowing that it will be guided by your presence and love. Be with our fair on Monday with the organisers, stall holders and all helpers. And as we start autumn, be with those who arrange and organise the various groups restarting after summer and COVID breaks. May they be guided by you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear our prayer, Lord, for those who suffer in mind, body or spirit. We bring before you all with immediate needs who are ill and who have asked for our prayers. Janie O, Nicola F, Angie H, Vic P and Dave, David Peter Walter. Also be with those with ongoing needs as printed in our bulletin. Be also with all who mourn, and especially we pray for the children, parents and families of those who have <clears throat> lost their lives in tragedy or violence. Be with them in their grief, and may they be aware of your presence and draw strength from your love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We commend into your hands, Lord, those whom we have loved. You gave them breath and loved them through their lives. We remember those of our church family who have died recently. Jean Goodwin, Anne Moulton, Barbara Grass, and any others known to us. We pray also for those whose anniversary of death is at this time. Alfred Buckland, Joan Reeve, James Holmes, John Butler, John MacDonald, John Zakopoulis. Receive them in your infinite tenderness and give them peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear our prayer, Lord, as we take time in quietness to make our own special prayers and needs known to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. <clears throat> As we end our prayers, may we know the warmth of Christ healing us, the eyes of Christ gazing on us, and the peace of Christ shining through us today and evermore. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen.
I invite you to stand for the peace. We are the body of Christ. In the one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Let us then pursue all that makes for peace and builds up our common life. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Let us offer one another a sign of Christ's peace. When you have done so, I invite you to be seated. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. To your goodness we have this bread and this wine to offer. May they become for us the bread of life and cup of your salvation. Blessed be God forever. When it comes to receiving um, communion, I'd ask you this week to do the same as we did last week, which is to form uh, two lines either side of the centre of the church and Alan and myself will distribute the sacrament from uh, just behind the altar rail. Um, as you come down, your hands will be sterilized, isn't quite the word, squirted with alcohol gel <laughs> before receiving communion. Please stand. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Blessed are you, Lord God, our light and our salvation. To you be glory and praise forever. From the beginning you have created all things, and all your works echo the silent music of your praise. In the fullness of time you made us in your image, the crown of all creation. You give us breath and speech that with angels and archangels and all the powers of heaven, we might find a voice to sing your praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. How wonderful the works of your hands, O Lord. As a mother tenderly gathers her children, you embraced a people as your own. When they turned away and rebelled, your love remained steadfast. From them you raised up Jesus, our Saviour, the living bread, in whom all our hungers are satisfied. He offered his life for sinners, and with a love stronger than death, he opened wide his arms on the cross. On the night before he died, he came to supper with his friends, and taking bread, he gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. 
do this in remembrance of me. At the end of supper, taking the cup of wine, he gave you thanks and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Father, we plead with confidence his sacrifice made once for all upon the cross. We remember his dying and rising in glory, and we rejoice that he intercedes for us at your right hand. Pour out your Holy Spirit as we bring before you these gifts of your creation. May they be for us the body and blood of your dear Son. As we eat and drink these holy things in your presence, form us in the likeness of Christ and build us into a living temple to your glory. Bring us at the last with the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Holy Apostles, St. Lawrence, St. Stephen and all the saints, to the vision of that eternal splendour for which you have created us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom with all who stand before you in earth and heaven, we worship you, Father Almighty, in songs of everlasting praise. Blessing and honour and glory and power be yours for ever and ever. Amen. Rejoicing to be called children of God, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, grant us peace. Jesus is the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Happy are those who are called to his supper. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word, and I shall be healed.
Let us pray. God, our Creator, you feed your children with the true manna, the living bread from heaven. Let this holy food sustain us through our earthly pilgrimage until we come to that place where hunger and thirst are no more. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Together we say, Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. I have some bands of marriage to publish. Um, so I've published the bands of marriage between Benjamin Hammond of this parish and Rebecca Connolly uh, of the parish of All Saints in Garston. This is for the third time of asking. And also between Sean Appleton of this parish and Sarah Richards of this parish, but with a qualifying connection to St. Martin's Ryslip. If any of you know any cause in law why these may not be severally married together, you are to declare it. Strike three, down for one, and uh, strike two for the others. We're getting there. Let's pray for them. Father, we pray for Benjamin and Rebecca, and Sean and Richard, Sean, Sean and Sarah. We ask your blessing upon them, and we continue to ask as they grow in their love for one another, they might grow in their love for you. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Just a few notices today. <laughs> um, coffee is available online after the service. Um, I would like you to have the congregational meeting next Sunday afternoon in your diaries, uh, please, so we can join together for that. I will be um, sending a pastoral letter out this week with lots of information about what's coming up over the coming term. Um, Arthur was very optimistic about lots of groups restarting in the autumn, which is great, but we do have limited capacity at the moment, uh, so do take a look at the pastoral letter with regard to what's going on uh, with groups in the autumn. Alpha will be starting next Tuesday, so as before, if you know anyone who would benefit from joining Alpha, um, please drop me a line. In terms of lifting the COVID uh, regulations, the lockdown, uh, next week we're going to reintroduce singing to this service, um, which will make masks entirely optional. Um, if you are uncomfortable with that, uh, then do consider coming to the eight o'clock service where there'll be more opportunity for social distancing and where obviously there won't be singing. Um, the other thing to flag up to you that's coming in the future is the Harvest Festival. I mentioned it last week. That's on the 26th of September. Uh, in addition to a meal following a later than usual service, uh, you're asked to bring various items into uh, worship, which we then present as part of the service. Again, information about that will be in next week's bulletin and indeed in the uh, pastoral letter that I'm sending out. Sheets to uh, sign up for the harvest meal are at the back of church and will also be in the pastoral letter. You will not have um, failed to see the bunting on the way into church. The fair is tomorrow, uh, starting at 10.30, running through until 2.30 in the afternoon. We're still after um, some cover for some of the slots for the various uh, stalls. So if you do have an hour available tomorrow, I'm going to ask if you have a chat with Sue Cobb, thanks Sue, who will take your name and pass it on to the appropriate authorities <laughs> um, to free someone from a stall. What else did he say? Yes, you'll see there are lots of items at the back of church. Um, I'm going to ask Sadie if she can open up the uh, hall so that various uh, muscly volunteers can take those across after worship um, today, if you wouldn't mind helping, please. The hall is open. 
fantastic. So Sadie doesn't need to open it because it's already open. So it's open for you to take those gifts across at the end of the service. Any other notices I've missed? No, we're all good. Okay, well, I invite you to stand for a final blessing. The Lord be with you. God, the Holy Trinity, make you strong in faith and love, defend you on every side, and guide you in truth and peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be upon you this day and remain with you forevermore. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. <laughs>